Um, and I'm going to talk on third trimester uh, nutrition and po postpartum beef cow nutrition. There's a hand out here in case you guys like to have it. Right there. Right over there. <clears throat> there should be a handout in everybody's, uh, perhaps two, uh, if there's an opportunity to share. Um, I know we're running a little bit late on time here, but we'll try to work through this uh, accordingly. So uh, with that, we have a lot of stress on our cows in the wintertime between the snow and the cold and the wind. Uh, there's lots of different ways to feed cows. Definitely a lot of snow this year. Uh, access to water is always an issue. We can always wonder whether they can survive on snow, but good mileage of a practice would always say provide plenty of fresh, clean water for cattle uh, in a liquid form rather than a frozen form. Um, how we feed our cows is a real question. Uh, a lot of people like to look at feeding cows at a low-cost route. Uh, we tend to try to not put as many dollars in as possible into a cow, but instead try to conserve our checkbook somewhat and try to get cows to uh, produce a good calf without spending a lot of dollars in feeds to it. To understand this, we really need to think about what nutrition really means in a cow herd, and obviously I talked about water there a little bit, but the next thing she needs is energy. That's the most expensive thing that we put into a cow, is the amount of dollars we spend on energy just to keep their blood flowing. Put some weight gain on too if possible, but it's the energy cost that's the biggest dollar expense per day per head. Protein is the biggest dollar per unit. Actually, vitamins and minerals can be a bigger cost per unit, but total dollars is really spent on feeding energy to cows. Proteins needed to digest the energy. Vitamins and minerals are needed for good health. A lot of our minerals in North Dakota, a lot of our feeds in North Dakota are short on copper, selenium, zinc. Always balanced for calcium and phosphorus. If you're feeding distillage grains, be sure to add extra calcium into your ration. And if you have got high sulfur water, uh, you're probably not feeding much distillage grains because you could end up with some sulfur toxicities or polio-like symptoms. Uh, if more questions on that, please ask at another time. As we think about feeding a cow through the winter time and after calving, we have to think about her energy requirements throughout the year. Of course, the most of the energy is required during lactation, and then uh, as the cows start to produce less milk, the energy requirements go down. You notice the cows peak in their milk production about two, 60 days, two months after calving, and then it abruptly stops at weaning time, which is usually sometime in our second trimester, and then as the calf grows bigger and the weather gets colder, our third trimester, or the th last three months of gestation, is where the uh, energy requirements of the cow picks up. Now for those of us that calve in the summer, in the springtime or May or April, usually the weather starts to get nicer about the same time the cow's nutritional demands pick up. So we may not have to worry as much about energy needs and kind of live off the cow's back as compared to somebody who's calving in January. The other option is the guys that calve in the fall time, uh, they're feeding cows during winter time for cows to produce milk for calves. In other words, the cows are lactating. It requires a lot of energy to produce milk for a calf if you expect to grow. The best way to measure your body, your energy status of a cow is to look at body condition scores. Basically, one is skinny, Nine is fat, really fat. Five is good. Um, there's been a lot of research done on this particular avenue, uh, and a body condition score, five and six at calving time, appears to be your best bet. If you go less than a four, there will be problems in getting cows to breed back. So let's go through a little list here of what a body condition score looked like. If you've got any cows that look like this, either you are probably got them sold, or you think she's open, or there's other problems going on, but that's how thin this cow looks. You can see the backbone off her top. You can see the tail head area. She's fairly emaciated. There's no extra fat in the brisket. These old cows you just not like to have around. That's a skinny cow. Here's another skinny cow. Why is she skinny? She's old. But she's still a skinny cow. There's not a lot to her. Not much salvage value at all in this particular cow. In these cows, their body condition scores four and five. Count the ribs in the side of a cow. If you can count four ribs like the cow in the upper left hand corner, one, two, three, four. That's a body condition score four. If you can count five ribs, you excuse me, a body condition score five only counts two ribs. So look on the side of the bottom left-hand corner, and I think you can only see two. Hopefully the, there's enough 
contrast for you to see that. Look around the tail head, look at the body. They look thrifty, they look okay, they're just not carrying a lot of condition. That's a 4 to a 5. I like to see them a 5 to a 6. Here's body condition score 6 and 7. You can see they're a little bit more rounded, smooth over the top. Not a lot of fat in the brisket, but definitely these cows are in good shape, good condition. They can withstand weather and they rebreed back quite quickly. What body condition score is this cow? I'd say a 6. 5 to a 6. It's really hard to see the ribs. You can't really tell, but if you look at the rest of the body condition, she doesn't look too bad. Look at this particular cow. Mm. She definitely has lost some body weight. She's not doing too good. If she's a late calver, maybe the way the winter might pull out would be the she might come out of it. The best thing a person can do with cows like this is to buy some barbed wire and develop another separate pen so this cow doesn't have to compete with feed for everybody else. There's some dominant things going on in the herd. She's not an old cow. She's just a cow that isn't getting her fair share. Maybe she's breaking teeth. Maybe she produced a big calf. Whatever the reason is, she's just not carrying extra condition, and that would be beneficial. Leaving her like is, she'll probably end up going out of the herd as an open cow. So... Body condition scores are a great way to measure the energy status of your cows. Go home, look at the cows. If they all look the same to you, ask your neighbor to come over and, and have them look at the cows. If you don't trust your neighbor's judgment, ask your local county extension agent there in the room, and they'll come out, and they'll give you an unbiased opinion of what those cows look like and whether they should really be fed or not. Yep, you're right. <laughs> I give you a lot of, of uh, trust there. Uh, point here is that a body condition score is around 80 to 90 pounds of weight. So it's really difficult to make a cow gain 90 pounds of weight in a month unless you're going to feed her a finishing ration. That's 3 pounds a day to gain 90 pounds in a month. Finishing rations are a lot of grain, not much hay. So if you're going to make a substantial change in her body condition in a short amount of time, it requires a lot of energy. It could be grain, it could be a co-product, anything that's high in energy content. However, if you got two weeks of 20 below weather, you can take off a body condition score pretty quick if you don't change how the cows are fed. Now, most of us don't see this. We all say, oh, the cows are really going through a lot of hay. Because well, cows will compensate by increasing their intake when we have extended periods of cold weather. And by increasing their intake, they're able to offset some of that weight loss. But usually we don't have two weeks of 20 below weather. Well, I'm not sure what usual is, but this year I don't think we've had solid that 20 to 30 below. Uh, so cows will compensate over a couple days if, if the weather does change somewhat. Now here's a point to look at. If a cow's thin, she actually needs more energy to stay warm than if a cow has got a little body condition. Here we got a 1,200-pound cow with a body condition score 4. She requires 17.2 pounds of energy just to stay warm, maintain herself at 0 degrees Fahrenheit. The same cow with a body condition score 6 now weighs 1,300 pounds. Um, it should be along 1,320, but you can see the amount of energy it requires is just a little bit less. So running cows a little thin, there is a means where you end up running them too thin and it actually costs more in keeping those cows going than if you had a little condition on her. Here's some energy and protein thumb rules for mid-gestation, late pregnancy, and then after calving. As you can see, the energy content goes from 55% TDN up to 65% TDN. requires more energy. I'll get to haze here in a little bit as an example later on. Protein content. You know, 7% protein is about all that cow needs, as long as she does get 7% protein. Most of our haze, with a little bit of alfalfa, will easily make that. If you're feeding any stover or straws and only grass hay and no alfalfa, you will be under 7% crude protein, unless you cut the hay in, in June. If you cut it in July or later, more than likely you're going to have a low percent crude protein. It doesn't take much to make 7%, but if we're trying to get as much rough feed into them as possible, um, we do need to look at our crude protein. And late pregnancy, it goes up a couple of percentages. After calving, it definitely goes up. We're usually lucky after calving because by that point, they're heading out to pasture, and what they select out on pasture is usually higher in protein and higher in energy than what they uh, would need if we delivered it to them. Dry matter intake for planting purposes is somewhere around 3% of body weight. Extreme cold weather, they can go up to 5 to 7%. Even higher if you let them waste a bunch of hay. Um, 
Here's uh, the same example except with some feed tests. As you can see, the grass hay TDN is 50%. That doesn't meet the cow's just energy needs. The alfalfa hay was 56%. That doesn't meet the energy needs of the cow. Well, in uh, late gestation or calving, if it was put up where it had a little bit better, no rain on it, then it would be okay. Um, corn stover is low in energy content. Corn silage is actually pretty good. Second cutting alfalfa is pretty good. So as you look down through how you mix and match, you can stage when you feed the hays accordingly or supplement accordingly to get the best out of, your, out of the hays you have. Now I like to stress upon you cold weather thumb rules. You know, when I walked outside yesterday, it was about 40 degrees and I didn't wear a coat. I thought that was pretty comfortable outside. Now, if that would have been last September, I think I would have been putting on a sweatshirt. We just adapt to our environment a little bit. And the same thing happens with cows. And in the wintertime, they'll adapt. It's been measured. It's called a lower critical temperature. That's how low it'll go before they think it's uncomfortable. So no wind, pregnant cow, 13 below degrees Fahrenheit. That's what the literature shows. That's pretty cold. If there's, any, if there's a wet snow and a 10 mile per hour wind, it gets up to 19 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's actually kind of cool. Now, we've had some colder weather than that, and so it requires a lot more energy when we do get in cold weather, but I just want to stress upon you, cows can withstand. With that furnace burning inside them, fermenting forage and feed, that produces a lot of heat, and that actually, and the hair and everything else, goes together to uh, keep a cow somewhat comfortable. If the weather goes colder than this lower critical temperature, you can basically say for... Every degree change in Fahrenheit, it's going to take a 1% more energy. And you can see through the slide what I'm referring to. Here's an example of feeding. I got some hay prices here for January and feed prices for January 2011. Um, you can debate whether you can buy hay for that, but and silage and grain's gone up right now. But um, we did this example, so uh, you can see the current prices. It's all different than last year. Here's some prod. Here's some some uh, sample rations for a 1,400 pound cow. She's mature, late gestation, just maintaining your weight. The mineral is at a quarter pound per head per day and it's a mineral balanced for the types of feeds that you're feeding there. If you're feeding a lot of straw and stover and distiller's grains, you will need to provide extra calcium. Um, if you're feeding distiller's grains, you'll definitely need to provide extra calcium, maybe a little bit of phosphorus. Uh, the trace minerals, copper, zinc, selenium, vitamin A are all needed and cost effective. As you look down through the different rations, you can look at the very bottom and see the costs. We'll go to the next slide and you can look at the costs again with the various different rations. And I'll switch to the next slide. Again, costs. Everything's between a dollar and a dime to a dollar twenty, or maybe a dollar and a quarter. It's difficult to feed cows exceptionally cheap these days based on current feed prices. Thank goodness we got high calf prices right now to enjoy. There's an example of what to look at, different types of rations. If you want to have a more specific one, contact myself or a local county extension agent and we can work through a ration for you or a feed manufacturer. They can do those, they provide those types of services too. Now, if we want cows to gain weight, it requires a different type of ration. Here's the 1,400 pound cow. She's mature, late gestation. We want to increase one body condition score over 90 days. So that's a pound a day average daily gain. If you start comparing the previous slides to these slides, we're basically giving seven to 10 more pounds of, of some type of co-product or better quality feed to offset in other words, to increase the energy content of the ration, the cost too goes from a buck twenty-five up to a buck thirty, a dollar forty. It's not cheap to put on the extra weight, so maybe it's easier to get cows in good condition and keep them that way rather than try to feed extra weight on cows. But if you do have thin cows, cold weather conditions like this, now would be the time to start looking at picking up the nutrient content for these cows so they can survive and their calves can survive because they're producing colostrum and a healthy calf at this particular time. Okay, now my next point here is to calculate the cost per nutrient. It's pretty easy math in my mind. Um, it's basically, well, I've got the math in front of you. It's the cost per pound of energy. TDN stands for energy. Total digestible nutrients. 
If you're a young person in the crowd, you can think of megacals of energy, but I like to use TDN. It's easier to think of and look at. If we're buying hay at $65 a ton, take 65 divided by 2,000, and the TDN of the hay was 80%, that's not right. That's probably some other feed. But in this example, you just keep dividing and dividing, and that gives your cost of TDN. Now you can compare feedstuffs. And I think I have some right here. Here's in January 2006. Corn was only a buck 65. Let's walk down memory lane. And alfalfa hay was $40 a ton. The cost of energy was 73 for the corn. And the alfalfa hay was 94 What was our cheapest cost of energy back then? Corn. Hay wasn't too far. Off. Hay wheat mids was in there. And then hay ranked right up there with barley. Hay wasn't necessarily a cheap source of energy. If all you're looking for is energy. In 2009, we did the same thing. Corn's now up to, uh, rather than $1.65, it's $3. Hay price went up a little bit. Now the cost per pound of energy is 133 Hay is 160 Golly, grain is still a cheaper source of energy based on these prices. Let's go to 2011. Skip forward two years. Now corn has gone up to 535 Hay's still at 65 Let's do the math. Wow. You know, this happens every so often where hay is actually cheaper to buy and feed than what corn is. I wonder how long this will last. I think this is a localized thing. It'll probably change for next year, so be aware. But you can see your cost of energy. If you want to just put weight on cows, uh, you need to redo these calculations every time you buy and find out if you're getting a good deal or not. You can also do the same thing with crude protein. It just takes a different calculation, a different uh, a coefficient to do it. But if you're looking at buying corn for its protein content, it's a very expensive deal. If you're looking at buying canola meal for its protein content, that's getting to be reasonable. Alfalfa hay is always figured in as a reasonable cost for buying protein. Uh, distiller's grains needs consideration because it's uh, getting very competitive uh, in the price of protein. You're buying energy and almost getting protein for free. Well, here's an example of cow nutritional requirements. 13 pound cow, body condition score 6, last third of gestation, winter hair, she's dry, no weight gain or loss, she needs 8 to 9% crude protein, TDN's 50 to 53, calcium 0.26, phosphorus 0.21. Here's some various haze we had in North Dakota. Gee, most of them met crude protein, but none of them met the energy content. Definitely an opportunity to improve uh, the ration if this is the only type of hay that was provided. You'd notice it in the cow condition. Now, if we have a cow that's producing milk, 20 pounds is her peak. She's going to need more protein, more TDN, more calcium, more phosphorus. And uh, obviously, we need to add more. My point here is with feed analysis, if you don't know what your haze are, let's do a feed test to find out what you actually have. You measure for crude protein, ADF, which is an indirect measurement of energy content, the minerals, and then from there you know what type of feed you have to supplement appropriately. I'm going to switch a little bit and say, so we've uh, fed these cows. And now we're looking at another way in which to think about how we feed them. There is something called feed, fetal programming. And that's basically, well, the question is, is can we affect how a calf's growth will be depending upon how well we feed its mother? There's some interesting evidence out there. You know, this is back in World War II and the famines that occurred um, around the Holocaust time. And they looked at a year in Europe where pregnant ladies were underfed. It was a famine. The children were born normal, they looked okay, but as they measured the lifetime experience of these children, they had more hypertension, more diabetes, other diseases were at a higher rate than their counterparts that weren't malnourished. Does this hold true within the livestock area? It appears there's some information there that says it would. It, and and you got to think of it from the perspective it deals with the development of the placenta, the blood flow into the placenta, how the nutrients get to the calf and how the calf's cells respond to those nutrients, and it imprints into it over its lifetime as to how that animal responds. So let's look at some studies here. Here's a Wyoming-Montana study where they took springborn steer calves, and these calves, this is before they were born in its mothers, during mid-gestation, the cows were ran in either a native grange pasture, which is kind of a low-protein, low-energy ration, or an improved pasture, which is 
basically better quality. The calves were were, uh, were weaned, backgrounded, and then basically weighed the same when they were placed in the finishing yard. When the calves were finished, the calves, the calves whose mothers, when they were pregnant, um, were on the native range that had poor nutrition to it. The calves had poor feedlot average daily gains, lighter carcass weights, lighter lower back fat, and lower marbling. But when they went into the feed yard, they're weighing the same. So it appears there is an influence on how we can affect how a calf performs later in its life by how we feed the mother when she's pregnant. Now here's a study in Oklahoma that looked at nutritional changes in the third trimester, four to seven months of gestation. Not very many cows, you can see the cow numbers, a dozen or so cows in there. Um, body condition score, that's BCS, at calving was on a high feed group. In other words, at four to six, seven months of age, they either fed them a high rate of feed, a moderate rate of feed, a low or a very low. And so you can tell if they started out the same body condition score, the high rate gained weight, the moderate rate um, gained not much, low basically stayed the same, and the very low lost a little bit of weight. Um, birth weights, I always get this comment, gee, we can't feed cows much, much. Well, let's put it this way. It seems like we can't give a lot of feed to cows because that will increase our birth weights. Look at the data of this study. Birth weight didn't change. It's all the same. Look at the average daily gain of the calves. Calves are actually gained better out of the cows. This is, I believe, feedlot, the weaning average daily gain. Gained better out of the cows that had higher nutrition than those that had less. Presumably more milk production. Or was it imprinting? I don't know. If you just split this out by body condition score at calving time, you can see that at body condition score, um, where they were, the average daily gain, hmm, not a lot of differences there. I like to point out the birth weight. Not much differences there either. There's other factors that are somewhat affecting the birth weight thing rather than feed. Okay, now let's just look at the cows. I think this is kind of, kind of wondering because it kind of presents a different viewpoint. At our USDA research facility out in Beltsville, Maryland, they took cows and they restricted the feed intake in the second trimester, the, the middle three months of gestation, and then provided that as extra feed during the third trimester to, to the cows. So they compared to the controls, which was an, a certain amount of feed throughout the whole second and third trimester, compared to those that, that were underfed during second, but given the extra during the third. And what they found out is that... Um, the cows that used the safe feed were actually more efficient. They actually put on a little bit more weight than if you just fed them the same all the time. But at the same time, we just talked about fetal programming and implanting and how that could affect calf's lifetime later on. Hmm. whole story isn't quite here. Anyway, feed savings are minimal, but the cow appears to compensate well if she's provided more feed. So... It's one way to look at it. I think we've looked at it in North Dakota from the stair-step feeding perspective, and it's been documented this does happen. Now, Nebraska did a study, a little bit different one than what John Duvetter talked about earlier. This one, they looked at the dietary protein in pregnant cows. Basically, the cows are run on winter range, which is low in protein, or corn stalks. They had both types of feeding, both with, both with or without extra protein supplement. The cows that had no added protein had more sick calves, lower weaning weight, lower finished weight, and less choice carcasses in the calves. This is an ongoing study. I think there's three years worth of data into it. Interesting. Okay. Now let's look at some more of the study. So they basically said, you know, it was better in the feedlot performance to provide extra protein to get more energy into the cows. Maybe it's a protein effect. Didn't, but now let's look at the heifer performance of those cows that were underfed. They actually went through and seen how the heifers performed, and they, act, they came up with a slightly higher pregnancy rate on those heifers, and with more of them calving in the early part of the calving season. So the good news is, if you, if you underfeed protein, maybe the heifers will pick up in the reproductive and be more efficient in their lifetime. Hmm. 
but then you sacrifice in the feedlot standpoint. I think there's a lot of issues out there in this fetal programming thing. We'll just have to see what works out. There's a lot of different projects going on across the nation, including uh, projects here at NDSU Center for Nutrition and Pregnancy. A lot of basic research is done at that particular center. So with that, let me just sum up for the end of the day and say that we need to feed a balanced diet with adequate energy. Energy is our biggest issue. Manage for a good body condition score. The goals of five to six could be five to a six body condition score appear to be best in a reproductive management. Um, I encourage you to feed test to make sure that the types of feeds you're feeding are what you uh, think you're feeding. And then realize that if you underfeed during uh, gestation, it can have long-term impacts on the calf's performance. So with that, I'll stop now and say if there's any questions or comments, I can certainly take those or we'll sum up. Um, may I just remind that uh, if you're in the room, if you have the evaluation form, be sure to hand that out and have the evaluation done before we continue on. Any questions? I have a question for you, Carl. On this trace mineral supplements, cows can store this stuff for a period and they tend to be higher levels in the growing season versus the fall or earlier. Do you think we need to be putting out a trace mineral supplement all year long or a real good targeted job at certain times? Will that be enough? The question is on um, trace mineral supplementation. Can we just do it at certain parts of the year or should we do it all year long? Um, during the later part of gestations, that's where I think it's most critical that we have supplemental trace mineral nutrition. Um, you'll see in, in projects where scours were a problem in calves, okay. nutrition was improved through supplementation of trace minerals prior to calving. And the longer you can do prior to calving, the better you can get your trace mineral supplementation in. Um, if you're going to cheat, maybe out in pasture, maybe during the low productive times of the year, I don't know if there's a really good project that shows uh, advantages to targeting certain times of the year versus not. And any time you do projects like that, you almost come up to the issue of, wow, we really haven't seen any advantage to supplementing. So it really confounds a picture. That's where I almost come back to feed test. If the feeds you're using don't have a, or adequate, supplementation may not be needed. But if you are short, then you really should supplement. And if you're extremely short, you need to supplement year-round. Did that kind of go where you're coming through, John? you got to, I guess, look for deficiency symptoms if you're cutting the corners, and if there's something there, you better put some more insurance in the program. If you've got a problem, we need to talk. And if you've got a, a perpetual scours problem that can't be offset just by management, more bedding, calving different time of the year, veterinary drugs and all that, scour guard, whatever, um, we need to look at the ration because that might be a... a trip in there too. By the same token, I always like to throw this one out, John. So how many of us in the room take a vitamin supplement? How many of us should? Now on our standpoint, we do eat a varied diet. So that might, uh, between tacos and roast beef and whatever else, chicken, we eat a lot of different things. And that might do it. But anyway, cows don't normally get that varied of a diet. Any other questions? Carl, I would add something up here to your comments. Uh, Tim from Bono. Yes. Uh, really, if you're having some health problems in those herds, my experience over the last quite a few years shows that water quality is a major factor there. And you mentioned that at, at, at the onset is that, uh, uh, you know, if you have high sodium content or high salinity water as a source for your herd, that definitely ties into uh, the herd's overall health and uh, so on. So uh, sometimes that can be a factor that uh, we want to pay attention to. Good point, Tim. Have a water quality test done in your, on your water. Yeah. Look for total dissolved solids, sulfur content. And um, the bottle of water I'm drinking on is probably 600 parts per million um, total dissolved solids. But if your water is 2,000, 4,000, 10,000 parts per million, you probably do have mineral interactions occurring with your feed because of the water. Well, I see our time frame is slipping away. Are there any other questions? We will get disconnected here in just a little bit. Any comments amongst the group? 
I just have one comment. I would request that the room hosts, if they have those uh, evaluations, if they'd pass them out so we can collect that data, it would be great. There. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Well, uh, if there's no other questions, I guess uh, uh, that ends our last session of the Dakota Cow Calf Clinics. If you have friends that um, wish they could have heard part of this, we do plan on having this available over the Internet at our NDSU, I believe it would be our Cattle Docs website. So just do a Google search of Cattle Doc, like documents, D-O-C-S, and uh, look for Dakota Cow Calf Clinics. Thank you.